Hi, everyone. Welcome to Us in Flux Conversations from the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. Uh, my name is Joey Eshrick, and I'm the editor and program manager for the center, where we use the tools of speculative fiction to get us thinking about our future in ways that are inclusive, imaginative, and inspiring. And Us in Flux is one of our responses to these strange and trying times, getting stranger and more trying by the day, it seems. Um, so every other week in the project, we publish a short story that explores themes of community, collaboration, and collective imagination in response to transformative events. And then we host a public conversation like this one to go even deeper on those topics. Uh, our latest story was published just last Thursday. It's titled Fourth and Most Important, and it is by the spectacular Nisi Shaw, who is here with us. Uh, Nisi is the author of a 2016 Nebula finalist, the alternate history novel Everfair, and the 2008 Tip Tree Otherwise Award winner, Filter House. Their most recent publication is Talk Like a Man, which is part of PM Press's Outspoken Author series. And uh, Nisi is also the editor of an anthology that's very close to my heart that we were just talking about, uh, which is called New Sons, Original Speculative Fiction by People of Color, which is expertly edited and has an incredible lineup of authors. So I'd, I'd highly recommend it. And uh, Nisi lives in Seattle uh, where they're working on Kinning, which is uh, gonna be a sequel to Everfair. Uh, we're also very lucky to be joined today by Ayana Jameson. Ayana is an organizer, educator, and the founder of the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network, which is a global community inspired and committed to uplifting and highlighting Butler's life, work, and new works inspired by her legacy. And Ayana teaches ethnic and gender studies at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. Uh, during our conversation, which we're just about to get started, I promise, uh, uh, you can submit questions for Nisi and Ayana uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. So there's just a little uh, thing with two thought bubbles, says Q&A. You can just click on that and type it right in. Uh, or you can tweet questions, and our Twitter account is at ImaginationASU. All right, so that's enough preamble. Let's jump right in. Um, so this conversation may go in a lot of directions, but we want to start with fourth and most important, which we were very lucky to publish. So Nisi, would you um, start by maybe just telling us a little bit about the story and, and what inspired it? Okay, so uh, fourth and most important is part of a series of short stories I wrote about a, a, an activist social movement called the five petals of thought. And this particular story was inspired by the idea of people working together and which is the theme of, of the whole series that us and flux and also the the uh, way that social media and contacts play into organization and activism so, uh, Ayana, what did you make of this story? What was the like uh, big idea you took from it or the thing that caught your attention most about it when you were reading it? Um, the thing that sort of broke my heart the most, I would say, is the fact that people are isolated for various reasons and that um, human contact has been commodified and people have had to adapt in order to be connected with one another. Things are highly regulated, familiar, um, similar to things that we have known, but also so different. And um, it feels really real. It feels like um, like something that could occur now and something that we're having to think about is someone else regulating how much we're in contact and what information we can give one another um, and um, really monitoring how we connect with one another. So there does need to be some upsurge. Um, it feels like really prescient and um, timely, given how we're all in isolation. Yeah, yeah. You know, we commissioned the story. Well, I think we'll get to this later. But we commissioned the story, you know, a while ago, and and have been talking to Nisi about it. She had the idea, you know, a number of weeks back. But uh, recent events have only, I think, amplified how relevant it seems, and given it all these points of connection. Uh, to what we're going through like literally right now. Um, literally. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's a story, I, I think, for those who, who maybe haven't read it yet, that's about people uh, who are connecting via a, a network of, of drones and balloons and passing messages uh, using these knotted threads called kipus, uh, which we might get to more a, a bit. But um, 
and people who are sort of striving to share resources and ideas in a, in a society in which there's a lot of institutions dedicated to preventing that. So again, yeah, startlingly uh, uh, real feeling. Uh, you see, I wanted to just to dig a little more into the story and its backdrop. Um, the uh, It's part of this ongoing uh, cycle about the five petals of thought. And, and I just wanted to ask you to expand on that a little bit. These All these stories that refer to the same, uh, what I'll call like metafictional book, uh, which we which we see some commentary about in the in the epigraphs and the in the text of the story. So I had a dream where there I, I was a, I was at work and someone asked me, I was telling them about a problem that I'd had and they said, well, why didn't you use the five petals of thought? And then I, um, there was like a segue in the dream to a history of the five petals of thought. And I, you know, like sort of this documentary scenario where I saw the school where they taught it, you know, 500 years ago. And then I woke up and you know, was looking through all these search engines trying to find the five petals of thought because it was so real in my dream. And no, it actually did not exist. So I wrote um, a story for the Aqueduct Press anthology, um, Missing Links and Secret History, um, which was basically a Wikipedia article about the five petals of thought and the book, the, the you know, million seller best, best seller book about it. Um, all the people who were followers and proponents. And then I wrote um, three short stories. Um, this is the third one I've written, fourth and most important. There's uh, the third petal which appeared in uh, Wired Magazine, um, New Action, which was in the EFLUX Journal. Um, and I'm also working on a novella with, with it in there. Um, what else should I say? No, no, I just, that's great. I, I guess I, I just wanted to give people uh, mostly even just a chance to follow some of those threads so they can pick up that Missing Links and Secret Histories. Uh, I know I double checked the Wired and EFLUX stories are free. So you can, if, if you're listening out there, you can go and find those. They're definitely uh, worth reading. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, it actually, you know, builds a foundation for something else I wanted to talk about, which is to, uh, you know, inevitably, I think uh, Ayanna roped in uh, Octavia E. Butler since you founded uh, the, the Legacy Network. Uh, the, the way that these kind of uh, like metafictional stories, you know, where the five petals has this, you know, uh, these stories have this movement, this discipline at the heart of them. Uh, Octavia Butler's in, in a sort of different vein has, has Earthseed, this religion in her parable books. Um, I'm wondering what you two think about these stories perhaps that do a little bit of meta work and bridge fictional enjoyment and exploration uh, with real world social action that uh, either within the stories themselves or perhaps even in uh, the world beyond the books. Um, you know, you s think of speculative fiction as a springboard for mobilization or create these, uh, I don't know, systems of ideas that uh, perhaps will percolate outside of the books and into people's day-to-day -day lives. I guess I can say something about that. Um, and even beyond the parables, I've heard of folks living in uh, communal family situ situations where there are multiple parents for an offspring and they're, the offspring are calling the parent figures, I think, Ika, which comes out of the, um, uh, of Lilith's Brood, the Xenogenesis mm -hmm. trilogy. Yeah which is a really radical way of thinking about like um, family and kinship and multiplicity and polyamory and things like that. So even beyond just something that's seen like activists taking it out in the street and protesting or thinking in a new way, it could just be in relationship. So it, it feels like it's happening. Maybe people see things that are familiar like, like Nisi's dream, when I was reading, um, I read the Wired piece and this story, like it's felt familiar, right? Like I kept thinking while I was reading it, well, which pedal are these like people who are really protesting, which, which pedal are they upholding? And the people who are not, like, could they pull them aside and be like, hey, 
now is not the time for the, you know this pedal you know this is the most important thing for you to be focusing on and it helped me to organize my anxiety about what's happening um and so it felt really real so i think there have been some movements that have taken pieces like we can talk about octavius brood edited by adrian marie brown and um Walidi e. marisha and crowdsourced and then eventually published by AK Press, right? Where they offer to go and do work with people in organizing and science fiction writing with folks. And so many people from so many different walks of life taking inspiration from Octavia Butler's Earthseed and other places, right? And working with it and saying, this feels familiar. This is something I can vibe with. So there are some places that have literalized things, right? Um, even to a kind of a scary degree, but then this feels, oh, it's like distilled w wisdom that does feel 5,000 years old, right? Like if we were to look for something, um, you know, it really like sort of opened my heart and helped to kind of calm myself and it made me want to, you know, brainstorm about what the petals are. So I really thank you for that, Nisi. Um, it was really soothing, even though maybe it's not supposed to be. What is your impression, Nisi? Do you think that it's like Octavia always said the earth seed is not comforting enough and therefore it can't be real, right? Because it's not, you know, you can't pray to the God and earth seed. But what do you like? What are your emotional impressions or intellectual impressions about the five petals? So the five petals are just to name them so that people know what we're talking about. Yes. Um, the first is thought. The second is action. The third is observation. The fourth is integration. And the fifth is new action, also called reaction. Um, so I think that I'm really, really pleased that, that this works for you as a sort of way of framing your, what happens in the world. Ha what framing reality for you um, because that's what it does for me as well and um, it's the kind of thing that makes you just sort of step back a little bit and um, process what's going on in a way that that you you can relate with other people uh, other people can say oh yeah that was the third pedal if they've read any of the stories right or rather what are you reacting to what is you what is your reacting to what can you integrate in order to temper your reaction um who do you think that it's helping like it just seems so fundamental um that i wanted someone to have a conversation with me about it <laughs> lovely that's so lovely yeah i mean uh all all science fiction is some sort of thought experiment and i'm i'm really pleased that this one is working the way i hoped well it sounds like like womanist praxis or like some kind of um like putting into action those things which you believe i feel like that's i i said in our private conversation that any written or published thing always is communicating some instructions for what you should do, whether it's didactic or not. Um, so this is more gentle and deliberate, right? However, everything that gets published is going to have some issue. Um, like, for example, there are folks who are power seeking, right? But the way that they're doing it is not by throwing a Molotov cocktail, right? there's a whole different kind of it, something else that's being burned, right? There's something that's incendiary, but it's a slow burning wick um, where things are being put into motion. I think the action of reading, the action of reading is a radical act that we can read something that, a, that someone wrote, right? That's been put into print, right? That, that elevates it to being important. Um, and uh, that is what feels the most radical thing to me. I think like the more people who read, um, not as leisure, right, but as a, as a resistance to just being fed information, right, as opposed to choosing what you consume, it's a whole different paradigm. Um, and I think that's what the power of science fiction or speculative fiction writing or black futurist, black speculative arts has um, a call to that action already because we are in the future, 
right? <laughs> We're in the future. Um, we made it. Yep. Yeah, I was just looking at, um, I forget the publication, but there was a piece that I, I read this morning that was from a tech tech news site and they were saying like so many cyberpunk stories right and that's a huge part of our like you know unofficial canon for speculative fiction in the west um are set in the 2020s so we're there we're like knocking on the door of that and so you know in some ways i think some of those stories uh you know they have these strong prescient elements you know about networked communication and things like that but also it's it's become blaringly obvious what they've left out and what they were what they were silent to i think um you know, the, the kind of wishful thinking of uh, enlightenment loving folks is that, you know, we would have been sort of past identity politics somehow, you know, 50 years later, 40 years later, when folks were starting to write these cyberpunk pieces and, you know. Well, uh, it was identity politics, but it was only a certain identity that was uplifted rather than all the multiple possible identities that we could have. White, cis, male, hetero, that was identity politics. I guess I kind of hate True. that expression because fair, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I, it, not a knock on you, but I'm, I'm imagining just saying, this kind of a Star Trekky, and you know, I think there's yes. this idea that like, oh, we'll just be be beyond all of that by you know in 40 years because you know we'll be dealing with like you know the encroachment of intelligent machines who are out to right. enslave us or something. But it turns but, out it's you know not so different of a set of uh, confrontations than it was a number of years ago. I mean, history casts a long shadow. Sorry, I, please continue. Ayanna. No, no, I just I just mean that what makes what makes this so contentious though and um probably nisi knows more about this than i do is the fact that other voices are being included and recognized and then it's like oh well that was you know that was just favoritism or oh this is what people said about octavia like oh this is just in vogue now like people mm -hmm. like having their pet negro and they're recognizing black writing because of the civil rights movement but it'll go out of fashion soon and that's kind of what's been said at many award ceremonies where people have tried to, you know, bring back the status quo when everyone else should just keep their mouth shut. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know. I do feel like it's an act of resistance to, to put a dream to paper and let it expand from there. Um, um, I don't know. I guess I have complicated feelings about um, what people have done with Earthseed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not all good. <laughs> right. Or even the content, I mean, even the contention about what has happened to Octavia's work in the present and how it's housed at a place that's not very accessible to regular folks. Um, you have to apply to be able to go and see it. You, you are restricted to looking at it during certain times. It used to be much more restrictive. So I, I don't know what we will how will we continue to make the work that we need to make, but also resist that uh, erasure that's happened so easily? It does happen really easily in things like Star Trek um, and, or even American Gods, all kinds of fantasy and science fiction and things being put into motion um, in moving pictures does end up having this conflict and it's a continual conflict. Like everyone's saying that they hate discovery just for the fact that they hate it because there's no male captain for them to glom onto. Um, can you talk, Nisi, about the sort of expansiveness of um, body and gender? Um, because I found that to be the most intriguing. Um, and... So um, the expansiveness of body, um, for me that, is in, in that in my particular story uh, fourth and most important uh, to me that is uh, personified by Willis who very much identifies with whatever hardware he's interacting with you know uh, when he's confronting uh, Piquel at at the end he says look in my belly not look in my drone's belly, but look in my belly. So uh, he is connected enough with the technology that it is part of, of him, even though there's not really a physical connection. It's him, it's his. And he knows that something is wrong, that he's reacting badly uh, to what is being said when he finds himself thinking, oh, I'm back on the couch, you know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm squeezing my phone. Uh, uh, but when he's, when everything is going right, when the flow is there, he's part of the machine and the machine is part of him. Uh, and then the expansion of gender, um, I tried to make that just uh, as matter of fact as I could in the, uh, the instance of Mix Piquel, uh, who is non-binary and um, is addressed throughout the story uh, as uh, they, them, their, because uh, they still are, there's, they're not a neuter, they're attractive sexually to Willis, but the attraction is beyond the binary. That's what I tried to do. Did it work? It did work. And also, you know, I started getting flustered when um, Pikel is like, well, you said you didn't want to come over to my place. I was like, whoo, what? Hey, whoa, what's <laughs> happening? You know, because um, he is so connected. I felt myself being lifted up and being taken inside. And then I saw, and who was they? Who was us? It was like, wow, I... I didn't realize that I had been drawn into the machine that way. <laughs> um, I mean, I wish I could have Zoom calls that were that sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I did notice. Yeah, the 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 choice of verb uh, when when he when Willis gets a little confused about something Piquel is saying, he says like he hates disconnects. They threw him out, and I I really like that um, set of choices that you made there because they're they're kind of technical words, right? That, uh, that like somehow the circuit gets disrupted that, that Willis finds himself in and that it's the place he seems to feel the least alienated and the most comfortable. Um, it actually reminds me, jumping a little bit here to something, Ayana, you said when we were talking previously um, about, well, it was about sort of like communities and uh, communities of resistance activism forming kind of organically. Um, and this story has a bit of that in it, that Piquel and Willis uh, seemed to get along when they met initially. Perhaps he was a little attracted to them. And, uh, you know, Willis also likes flying these drones. So it's like there are, there are these reasons that they're involved in this, uh, that Willis especially is involved in this network. Um, and some of them are pretty mundane, you know? Willis likes the opportunities that being in the network affords him. And, he's attracted to this person who's part of the network perhaps. And, and, and so it's like these more uh, quotidian reasons for getting involved in, in, in what might be like a, you know, a fairly deeply radical operation by the end of the story, it's quite clear. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was talking about, we, we, were, we were talking about how when the apocalypse hits or when something happens, those folks who happen to be around you are the folks who are on your team. I have uh, three brothers who used to watch television in the 80s. I know I sh I'm telling on myself, but they'd be like, oh, I want that guy in my army. Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the guys that they wanted in their army. This is the time when Terminator and things are coming out and they're kids, right? But I'm um, talking about um, Willis's sister, the reasons why he's there and what it is that she can contribute to the movement is limited because of something that's happened to her. I mean, um, this happens though, you sort of get drafted into other people's stuff by virtue of being prox, uh, you know, physically close to them. Um, just like in the other story, the lady seeing one another on their balconies, right? Um, even though one is going blind, she can still see movement and color um, and smell and sense things. So for me, it was such a huge contrast between someone losing their sight and peripheral vision and their world like literally closing and that they're trying to expand their world at the same time. Um, Willis has had some kind of bad breakup where their therapy was a therapy ferret has been, you know, taken and he's like betting his sister that if this doesn't go well, then he's going to have to try to get together with his ex for some, you know, drunk dialing sex or something like it's like there's funny moments that are in it, but also it's really serious. So how desperate do we get? And in that desperation, can we make a choice to be in the community with the people that we're in? Do we even like the people who we're with, right? Um, these are some real questions this opened up for me. And I think people are finding this out. There's a higher incidence of, of domestic violence. 
True. Um, and uh, all kinds of things that are happening in this paradigm where people are, are told to shelter. I mean, here in LA County, we had a 6 p.m. curfew last night, right? So if you wanna go for a walk and take your dog for a walk in the evening, you're not doing that because we're under curfew. However, it's enforced by whomever and in what right. capacity, right? We don't know. So. Yeah, I, I, I understand that um, it does seem sometimes sort of random who's on your team, so to speak. Uh, in the, my situation, I'm in an apartment building um, I had rented out the apartment next to mine uh, for, and my mother was living there until she passed away two years ago. Um, now my niece is living there. So yeah, my niece is on my team. But also down at the end, there's this guy named Liam and he was about to drive out yesterday during our 5 p.m. curfew. I was like, hold on, Liam. Hold up. There's a curfew on. And so, you know, I, I was playing the part of like nosy lady in the building, you know, watching him go out to his truck, but I was also preserving my team. Right, because if something goes down, you wanna know where your folks are, even if you don't, if everything they do, you don't agree with all of their choices, right? Exactly. Um, like during this time, my neighbors come to use my washing machine because theirs broke. And I'm like, just come into the backyard. Our laundry's outside because the house is too old for internal uh, washing. But th these kinds of things, right? Um, it's, it's, um, I can't believe it's been two years since your mom passed. I'm like, when you said that, I almost didn't believe it. Like in my heart, it's, it's been that long. Um, I'm so sorry to even, I can't imagine. But I love that your niece is there. Is it the one that I've met? Um, no, actually her younger sister. Oh. Who's actually oh. much more mature than the one you met. <laughs> this sort of like speaks to what I was talking about before in that parenting and auntieship and uncleship are so, there's so many possibilities for who's on your team and what they mean to you at whatever moment. Um, and I, I, uh, I do think it would be interesting. I feel like there's not a lot of dialogue, right? Especially in-person dialogue. And I know that you, you teach writing all the time. I sort of wonder, I'm like, what is the five petals of, you know, like, how do we, how do we address our writing process with the five petals? Like, even though this is not a real thing, I feel that this is coming, even though it makes, it's not, it's not a thing, but I feel that this is coming. Well, Nisi's thinking of an answer. I just want to remind everyone, we've got a couple Q and A questions for when we shift to that in a little while, but uh, I just okay. want to remind everyone, please send in questions. Uh, you can use the Q and A at the bottom of the screen, or you can go on Twitter to Imagination ASU and send us a question. Um, needs to go ahead sorry i just wanted to put that plug in for cute for questions oh yes more questions um you know i when i reread this story i realized that there was no actual dialogue for several paragraphs and that is so not like me um because uh dialect and dialogue are are uh, some of my favorite topics when i'm when i'm teaching when i'm talking about writing when i'm sharing with students um yeah, I don't know. I, you're opening up all sorts of vistas for me. How do we apply the five petals of thought to writing? I had not considered that. Maybe I'm doing it automatically. I don't know. I better like uh, observe. I better use the third pedal there. <laughs> it does. Um, this idea of like the system, you know, the system as it's applied to writing reminds me of something else that uh, uh, that we talked about before, which is um, the idea that these stories. Uh, these these pedal stories, I think, especially Nisi, but a lot of your writing, you know, if I may, has these kind of loose or tighter in, uh, interconnections with some of your other short fiction. These motifs that show up again, uh, lacking a pat conclusion, uh, you know, which is I think tricky to do well at, at such a short length. And and uh, you know, these stories are immensely satisfying, I think, and so you you really pull it off. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know, I wanted to like, you know, sort of just probe you there about like, how do you approach these issues and especially in shorter pieces about like interconnectedness to other pieces or closure on the other hand. And um, 
you know, on, on the other end of that, Ayana, I'm wondering as a, as a critic and an educator, like what, you know, how you approach the kind of like stylistics and the politics of like these issues about closure and connectedness and open-endedness. Cause I think none of these stylistic issues are politically vacant. You know, they're all mm -hmm. sort of like very politically saturated. I had not thought about it in, in terms of uh, the political aspect, but um, it does seem very much um, in tune with the cyclical nature of the five petals of thought. Um, I just, you know, I, I get castigated over and over again by certain people for not having strong enough resolutions in my stories. Um, even people who are, who are reviewing me favorably, uh, like Gary Wolf was reviewing uh, stories in Talk Like a Man, and he pointed out, well, you know, the story doesn't really finish. Uh, it just, there's a, there's a, an emotional arc and a resolution there, but, you know, the action could continue past when she stops writing. Um, he referred to me as she. So um, that to me is not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> that is what I want to do is have loose ends at the end of my stories. Uh, sometimes they will connect to another story in, a same, in the same series. I have the five petals of thought stories. I have uh, stories related to Everfair. I have uh, stories about a talking dog named um, Betty. So I've got Black Betty, Red Maddie, White Dawn. Um, and, and to me, that's how the world is. The world is not chopped off and ended. It, it, um, it continues to grow and to uh, turn and, and to weave into to, uh, new days, new stories. Um, so I'm very glad that you think I pulled it off with this short little piece because challenging length for sure. I think we're we're very brutal. Fifteen hundred words is tough. Well, no, I've I've tried shorter even. Um, I think the third pedal uh, is about eleven hundred words. So that was the wired one. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna yeah they're gonna be really short too in a lot of cases. I think yeah things that I don't know I. I I, we've, we've been learning through this project about flash and, you know, like what you can do at this length. And I, I don't have any set conclusions about what works well, but uh, I've been seeing a lot of great examples of writers that we've had uh, take on this project do incredible work. And so I look forward to once we have enough of them, like, you know, sitting with them for a while and seeing what really works. I've never edited at this length before. And it's, it's tricky to figure out like, you know, those, again, some of these issues that, on all short fiction about like closure and character development and arcs, but uh, I don't know. This is one fourth and most important feels really roomy. Um, you know, it feels like you get to know the characters pretty well. And I, I, I mean, that's a really neat trick. I don't quite know how you did it. But I think the dialogue is is a huge part of that. Um, yeah. Uh, Willis is actually uh, also a character in New Action, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and Bridie from um, from the uh, third pedal. She's in, in new action as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I do try and, and uh, stitch things together with, with yeah. people as well as with concepts. And I, I feel that yeah, does this, sorry, yeah, I was just gonna well, sort of turn it to you. Does this strike you in any way? Either some of the things Nisi's brought up or this kind of issue of open-endedness, closure, some uh, of those issues. I, I'm thinking about a class I taught in the spring last year. It was a, a contemporary African-American experience class. And uh, I assigned this film called, I think, Good Morning Hale County, which was this documentary on this town in like Alabama or somewhere. And I had students that said like, how are these black people speaking up for themselves? Like, why did they sit down and interview them and ask them, you know, why they were working at the catfish plant or whatever it was, right? And I, I sort of had to check myself and say like, this is what my process is. And I think this is part of maybe when people are criticizing open-endedness, they have an issue not with the story itself, how it doesn't end, but rather that it doesn't do what the critic is assigning or how they would have done it. So I had to tell students, you have to be self-reflexive. You cannot judge something based on how you would have liked to have it done. Because the fact is we're not in the South, right? We're in California where we're in an institution 
that's supposed to be equal and that has all these minoritized folks in this room, but you cannot say, this is how I wish those people had spoken up for themselves. Those people are already speaking up for themselves by being alive, right? So I do think when this critic is misgendering you and also saying, you know, it has a nice arc, but it doesn't do what I would have wanted it to do. It doesn't give me the lift off or payoff that I want. Then that's more about the critic than it is about the author or even the characters who have a life of their own beyond the author, I think. So that, I mean, that's, you know, it's a very, it's very difficult to teach reflexivity to undergraduates, right? Because they think they know everything or they think the things they've been told so far are the things that are acceptable. But speculative fiction, particularly this kind of open-ended speculative fiction doesn't give people someone to put the mask of hero on, um, the conquering right. hero. Right. And I think that's what people are resistant to is not having someone they can identify with outright even when that person is doing wrong things, so-called wrong things, as opposed to it being a non-binary situation. Something having a continuous ending is also non-binary. It's not like finished and done. It's mm -hmm. ongoing and expansive, which is very different. And it's hard for us to think that way. We want all the answers quickly. I, I was looking up words I didn't know while I was reading it on my phone, right? <laughs> um, I'm interfacing with technology as people are being you know, their technology is being regulated. And I, I had to like, call myself back, like, wow, Ayana, that's really privileged. You know, <laughs> um, think about what you have. And remember, like Lauren Olamina in Parable of the Sower, she's like, 10 years old, she's going to turn 10 years old in 2020. Right? Or she, yeah, next month in July, she will turn 10 years old. 2024 is when that takes place. We don't have a year um, in, um, the fourth and most important, but we feel that it's right around, you know, we, we feel, we intuit when it is um, and when it could be and when it might be. That's really political in itself, right? Not giving people the tidy ending is an act of resistance to the hero, heroic Campbellian narrative, I think. Thank you, thank you, because that's what I'm trying to resist, hey, people. And yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is something that is really, we're trained to expect. I, I as a reader, have been trained to uh, expect this, and I had to uh, sort of deprogram myself um, and, and uh, look to all sorts of other examples of how it could work outside the canon. Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. I, yes. I, um, I just read a short piece and, and he did a podcast as well as he sometimes does with his articles, but Cory Doctorow wrote about writing rules uh, for his new site, Pluralistic recently, or no, perhaps it was his Locust column, but he also recorded it in his podcast, which is how I listened to it. And, you know, his point was like, there are lots of good writing rules and, you know, like closure, uh, some of them pertain to closure, but his point was like, they're not, you know, it took him this long to realize, like, these aren't really rules. What they are is their guidelines. And what they are is they're saying, like, this is hard to do well. So, like, you know, don't use too many uh, adverbs or something, or don't have your story be too open-ended. It's like, if that's, those are things that are easy to do poorly. And if you can figure out how to make it work, like, they, they fall away. I think sometimes those rules can get implanted a little too deeply in all of us with, to, with regard to, you know, ed critics, editors, writers, uh, audience. And, um, you know, f for him, I think the, you know, where he gets to in that piece is that, like, there's a lot more space for bending and rejecting those rules, but it's just about being confident in what you're doing and making sure that, like, you're, you're doing it with, with craft and intentionally, as opposed to, um, you know, sticking to the rules um, in a kind of blind and thoughtless way. I, I went to a a symposium, a cyberpunk symposium in Detroit back in, oh, I don't know, the 1990s, I'm going to say. Um, and one person in the audience brought up the connection between sexuality and the traditional story arc. Uh, and, and he was talking about how, you know, you have like, the arousal, the climax, the resolution. And he said, but if you're looking at this from the viewpoint of someone who's not male, 
then you have like, you know, maybe multiple orgasms, multiple climaxes. And then afterwards, you've got like these kids. <laughs> so, you know, it lasts a lot longer. It's a lot different structure. So um, I think back on that occasionally when I'm worried that I'm not following the rules. Hmm. Um. And whose rules, though? And this is like, you know, part of education, I'm sure you all agree if you're interacting in an educational way, is sort of decolonizing while you're working within a very colonized institutional structure. And it's yes. very challenging. Um, which is why, you know, people even hate fiction. They're like, oh, we don't, we don't study literature. We're studying case studies and ethnic studies. I'm like, you don't think the people writing the literature have ethnic identity that they're expressing through their writing? <laughs> you don't think their writing is a case study in who we are? Then okay, I can't help you, right? Um, but there's that push-pull also. It's very, um, it's frustrating. It is frustrating that you want to burn it all down, but if you want to pay your bills and eat, right, you are employed in these institutions that do have this very specific structure um, and very specific expectations. Um, you know, I, you can be resistant to it, but also I love the way that the characters in these stories work within the systems to apply for as many benefits as they can get because they need them and can pass them along to other folks or can stow them away or can increase the traffic on these balloons because it'll mean more information can get passed, more information can get learned, which is a whole different uh, thing than let's say, uh, you know, there's a Netflix, Netflix series where there's the auto fact, right? Did you guys see the Philip K. Dick, like what, how, there's like a series that they made based on Philip K. Dick stories. And one of them is where Janelle Monet is an android and she uh, is, is an android that goes to tell people, you know, stop blowing up the drones, delivering things from the Amazon warehouse, basically, right? That structure has the characters that are outside of that paradigm, right? And it's more open-ended, but it, um, it sort of takes us along in that structure of like, oh, build up flashback, build up flashback, resolution, but the resolution is not what you think it's going to be. Um, and so it's a very, it, it speaks, you know, science fictional things like the elements in it tell us more than if we had just adhered to that structure. I can't wait till some, I can't wait till we escape that. I cannot wait. So um, to pick up, Ayanna, on one of the things that you brought up, uh, uh, I want to shift to a question we got from the audience. So this is from Alex. Um, and Alex says, I'm really interested in the drone tech of the world. And this gets to like working within systems and exploiting them, I think, uh, for what you can make of them and what could be good of them. But uh, Alex says, I'm reminded of the technological interventions that were introduced after Hurricane Katrina and how those were appropriated and repurposed by citizens after FEMA left. So kind of taking the detritus of a partial government intervention around a catastrophe and then reusing it in community responsive ways. Uh, I don't know, is there, uh, Nisi, a sense of like, were there models for where you, where you drawn for this, this drone technology uh, or examples of people using drones in creative ways or other technologies like that? Well, I do think that people are already using drones in many creative ways. Um, I think that this is one of those technologies um, uh, like cars that, that people are just, you know, they, they buy it and then they modify it. Uh, the modification that I talk about uh, Flora doing um, is based, as far as I can tell, on, on totally, totally manageable and accessible technology. Um, I have people uh, charging their drones uh, for flight by stroking them um, mm. like like a pet or a bird and uh, the analogy for that I mean we've had wind up wrist watches for you know how many years decades a hundred years yeah um, I think they're a couple hundred years old actually yeah yeah so um, the, the, you know that that can be done um, the most recent cases I've seen were uh, for people who are like 
you know, a wearable computer. Um, you can charge your computer suit by uh, the energy of your shoes striking the sidewalk. Um, so, so I, I just think it's, I don't think it comes necessarily out of a catastrophe, but I think it is the kind of thing that people are probably already doing. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question about a story detail, so I'm going to put that one in here, which is Macy asks uh, uh, about the kipus, and they had the same question I did, which is, are they uh, are they based on a, on a on a on a real thing? You know, I did I'd ask you about this. Oh yeah, yeah, there there are kipus. Um, the ones that we have uh, still existing are now in museums. Um, they are uh, basically most of them are re records of you know taxes and uh, crop production and and that kind of thing um, that would be passed from one end of the Inca Empire to the other. And um, I'm. I'm doing a little bit of a song and dance there when I have them used as uh, more than numeric messages, but I don't think that that's much of a stretch. Um, these yeah. folks seem pretty, pretty creative. I feel like they could come up with something, but yeah, they're used for these ciphers uh, to, because of the, uh, to skirt the antitrust authority in the story, I should say, uh, for folks who haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah. And in, um, in new action, um, I, address the point that a cipher can be learned and um and so subverted so yep uh speaking of jamie this is just all the like detailed questions in a in a row but jamie jamie asks uh, uh where they can find the story of the fifth petal and is that is that the one that you're working on as a novella or oh um no the 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 fifth petal is new action so that's the story about the fifth petal uh, new action is that E flux. Is that, that's the E flux one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Jamie, the on E flux, which is an online journal that is free, you can read the new action story. Yeah. Uh, and then so there's a third pedal. Um, fourth and most important is the fourth pedal. I haven't written about the first two, um, or I haven't. I probably won't finish that novella till next year because I'm trying to finish a sequel to, to Everfair right now. Good. Good. <laughs> Everybody else on the call is very pleased about that. Um, so I, I have a couple more questions I wanted to shift to, and, and they're kind of big questions, but we'll, uh, we'll see how we do with them. And we've got about a little over 10 minutes left. Uh, and if folks have other questions, I'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, so, you know, to, to, to maybe ask my biggest, most broad question, you know, the story takes place in the wake of a number of changes in the, in, the, in the world of the story. So there's this antitrust authority, there are crackdowns on speech and free association um, and things economically going on that seem like extensions of the kind of like austerity driven turmoil that we're living through now. Um, and we were marveling when we talked a few days ago about the fact that the story mentions a government intervention against social media platforms. And of course we saw that last week come out of the US White House um, in the form of an executive order, um, which, which gets to something that uh, we talked about with Ayana, which is, you know, warning uh, is, is, do you think of this story as a story of warning in any way? Or do you think warning uh, folks in one way or another is an important function of speculative fiction? Uh, and, and if not, like what, how do you imagine, you know, what, what, I don't know, if it's not warning, what is it then in this story, I guess? This tiny, tiny little story is not just a warning, it's a hybrid. Um, it's a warning and um, uh, an idea of, of hope, a concept of, of moving forward. Wouldn't you say, Ayana? I would say, I would say, yes, people will find a way. And also, people have been finding a way. We have things like the Green Book. We, ha we have people taking in each other when they need help. Um, we've had these things, but they've become out of fashion, right? Um, and I think it's not a warning, but it is very um, retro, -futur retro futurist in that people have been caring for one another's neighbors and doing caregiving outside of environments where they're going to get paid or compensated by, you know, fictional cash in a bank somewhere. So I think that it is hopeful to me that we already know everything that we need to know, 
we just have to have that affirmed in our communities. That's the message that I got from it. And that there's someone who thinks like you and believes the way that you do and can bend your mind and expand it, even if you haven't met them yet, even if they haven't taken you into their home yet, there's a possibility of that. That in, in, um, anticipation was really rich for me, I thought. Uh, Ayana, as someone who teaches Black speculative fiction and, and is an advocate for it and a scholar, uh, you know, do you, do you think warning is sort of uniquely tied into a lot of Black speculative fiction stories? I know you talked about Butler's stories, some of them in that way, and then I'm reminded for some reason of Walter Mosley's Future Land, which I think is like an incredibly stark warning uh, about a possible well, direction. Well, all science fiction is like, um, someone said there are like three things, and people have probably heard this before. Stories fall into these umbrella categories, like what if, if only, and if this goes on. Right. Um, and the stories that we think are warning are if those if this goes on stories, but also Nisi's writing always has the what if and the if only it's not um, a longing where something is so far in the distant that it's, you know, you know, what if we could teleport or create our food and machines. Right. It's in relationships. Like what if I could be in contact and in communion or what if I had some answers that I don't have now. So those three things are in all science fiction. I think for those of us who are involved in survival, right, not being literally killed and suffocated to death, that warning of some, uh, not retribution, but some action, right, some reaction, right, the fifth pedal, like, you know, how will we react, right? The ways that we reacted in the past are not the ways that we're going to react now is what's happening in this world. I, I just think it's embedded in all science fiction. And, um, you know, I teach a lot of minoritized students and students who are immigrants. My dad was an immigrant from Jamaica, right? Like we're achieving things that our parents could not dream. Like we, you know, we're living and manifesting in a way that we was not allowed for other folks. Um, and so I do think it's really important to just acknowledge that science fiction as a genre is so wide open, um, which is why I love to teach it when I'm talking about social justice is, his, it, issues and history and government and politics, right? Which are all in the various disciplines that I bring into my ethnic studies teaching because that's the reality that folks are experiencing. And we can affirm that reality. Sometimes these things are not being written about elsewhere, right? Like yeah. those networks of caregiving um, and people literally, you know, keeping their siblings alive by, you know, changing their diapers and so on. Like this is real. Um, and um, sometimes people earn enough money to have distance from it, to keep their 3000 square feet, right? Um, and have their own little universe, but that's not the world that we really are living in. And we are finding that out right now. So I don't know, I hate to keep saying the same thing, but I, I guess I'm just like so pressed by the situation, especially as a parent, right? I have a kid who's starting kindergarten in the fall. What will his kindergarten be like? He was pumped to go, but he's yeah. not going to get the experience that many of us had because you cannot go to school. And also kids that age are disgusting and germ filled anyway. Right. But it's a pandemic. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be, um, I'm going to love, I'm going to love seeing what kinds of fiction comes out of this particular moment to see Joey, whether or not, your question becomes like whether that becomes more real, right? Whether that manifests itself more in reality, um, given the circumstances that we have now. I don't know what everyone else thinks. So I do want to, uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to ask my last question because it's one we've been asking in every uh, uh, one of these events. And I love to hear what folks have to say. So. Um, and it, it gets at, extends, I think, Ayana, some of the things that you were talking about. And you could feel free to say them again if you'd like, because I think they're true. But um, which is, what is this story and our conversation about it, I guess, fourth and most important, ha have to tell us about community? I think to me, you know, we've got a cluster of themes in Us and Flux, but all the stories, I think, talk to community in some way. And I, I wonder what each of you, you see what, what kind of thought went into the story and what's come out of it now that you're done about community and Ayana, what you made of community and, and the lessons the story has to teach us about it. So for me, what uh, the story is about is the idea of 
community as inclusion rather than exclusion. Um, because there, there are different ways to build community. You can, you can draw a line and say, my community is on this side and y'all on the other side, you're somebody else. Or you can say, my community is here and we can reach out and bring us together. Um, my friend Elise Bryant, uh, a union organizer and uh, playwright, uh, always talked about it in the shorthand phrase, bridges, not walls. That's what this is about, bridges, not walls. And I feel like any walls that exist are going to be crumbled and, and penetrated um, even when they are erected. Um, people find ways to be in communion with one another. I think I am thinking back to the small passage about integration and oh, I have the same feelings about integration um, as not have been the point, right? We were talking about desegregation, not leaving people out, but how do we incorporate them and include them and let them be who they are and contribute something in whatever body they're in in whatever capacity of ability. I think it really speaks to the possibilities of community that we're not yet seeing. Um, again, in the ways that folks who um, are disabled have been saying, can I work from home for decades, right? And right. now everybody has to work from home, right? Um, people have been saying like, oh, you know, online learning is inferior because I did that for many years for about 10 years before I started teaching back in the classroom. Um, and come to find out my expertise is valuable, whereas it was not valuable before, right? <laughs> um, and so I do think it's community as we've seen it and we have yet to see it because there's so much solidarity across different groups and individuals. And that's what I love about Nisi's writing is that I just wanna like eat it all up and feel full, right? Um, in this world that can leave you so empty. So thank you for that, Nisi. And thank you for being in my community. Like Nisi, I feel, I project onto her that she, she they, they could be my relative. When my mother and Nisi are in the same room, they could be related. And so I always feel that kinship, like literally coloring, hair, you know, body type, everything. It's like, I, I don't discount that, right? I own it and I take it and accept it and hope that it's something that's accepted for me. I do think we're headed in a direction, I, I hope, where these stories in flux, like when we're in flux, we can still be in community and in relationship with ourselves and with other folks. And I thank you for having us and writing this story and having us to speak. I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue to my, to my outro. Thank you, Ayana. And uh, so I just wanted to say to both of you, thank you so much. It's been an honor and delightful to talk to both of you and, and hear both of you today. Um, I, I wanted to give you each a chance to say, uh, if, if people wanna learn more about your work or sort of follow you um, online, like where is a good place? Where, well, where would you send people? For me, I'm really, really easy to find because uh, Nisi Shawl, yeah, there, there's not a lot of us out there. Um, I have a website, uh, which is kind of out of date, um, but which I will probably try and fix. Um, it's every writer's I, lament, <laughs> the out of date website, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, um, I have uh, uh, my most recent books you talked about in, in your in your um, introduction, um, Talk Like a Man. There's a primer on Nisi Shawl that has a, a new story. Um, yeah, I have a, a historical fantasy, a middle grade novel coming out from Lee and Lowe, hopefully next spring. Excellent. And that's called Speculation. And that you can find that, but mainly you can just search for Nisi Shawl. I'm out there. And we and uh, you can be a patron of Nisi Shawl and uh, Nisi Shawl makes some excellent tea. <laughs> oh, that's um, right! I have a Patreon page. I forgot to say that. <laughs> How about you, Ayana? Well, um, you can find um, at OEB Legacy on Tumblr, where Moya Bailey curates the collection. There, we're on Facebook at OEB Legacy, probably most actively. 
We're on um, Instagram at oeb.legacy. And we do have a, a Patreon that is in need of updating as well. And if you Google anything with Octavia Butler and A-Y-A-N-A, -A, chances are it will come up with my name. Um, and there are many, many things that we've curated that people can go and learn from and lots of free resources like TED Ed videos, all kinds of things. If you want to start doing this work and reading these things and knowing who else is involved, that's a great place to support and look for our work. Um, and also, you know, check out your connections on social media because that's how I found many folks, right? I think I was Facebook stalking Nisi for quite a while before I said, oh, Nisi, please come to this thing that I'm having. And the rest is history. Like this is so, it's so great. Thank you so much for bringing us in dialogue. It's yeah. been amazing. Um, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, live by the pedals. I may tell my offspring about it because I do mm -hmm. think that they'd love it. Um, so our, our next story, uh, I'm excited to say, is by a, a recent Nebula Award winner as of a couple days ago, Sarah Pinsker, and that'll publish uh, on Thursday, June 11th, so very soon. And we'll have another one of these conversations in a couple weeks on Monday, June 15th with Sarah and another special guest at the same time, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, you can find all of our stories and register for our events at csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. And in fact, like a video of this event and all of the uh, previous events uh, that via YouTube will be available on that same website, csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. So thanks again to both of you for your time uh, and, and your wisdom and, and for, for trying this out with us. And uh, thank you everybody who joined us on the on the event today for, for being here with us and supporting us and, and being part of our community during this time. And I hope that you all have a lovely rest of the afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And thanks, Nisi. Safe. Thanks, Ayana. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank yes, you. everybody Thank stay you, safe out there. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you, Joey. Right. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>